Okay, so uh, the focus for today is going to be on uh, doing using model-based meta-analysis to deal with longitudinal data, uh, which uh, we've certainly encountered in a number of cases, and it does pose some some additional issues. So that'll that'll be most of what we'll talk about. Uh, is something of a lead into that. What I wanted to talk about first is uh, an issue that that also crops up when we're dealing with with meta analysis. Uh, it's particularly apparent with longitudinal data, but not just longitudinal data. Uh, and that's the issues that arise from the fact that we often analyze summary data using models that we've originally conceptualized based upon uh, describing individual data. Uh, so that's, I guess, my first bullet point essentially saying that. So we commonly apply models originally developed to describe responses in individuals, but then we'll apply it to aggregate data, particularly sample means. Um, however, those models are usually strictly relevant only for describing responses in individual organisms and not for summary stats uh, for groups. Uh, and in particular, uh, for when we're dealing with nonlinear individual models, they don't in general collapse to the same model or the same functional form uh, when we when we look at sample means, except in some special cases. And in particular, uh, they do collapse in cases where uh, the model function is linear with respect to individual specific parameters in the model. And I just wanted to sort of bring that home by giving a, a couple of examples. These are certainly overly simplified examples, but they kind of illustrate the issue I'm trying to bring out. So let, let's start with an example of just dealing with the case where we're talking about, say, a one compartment model. So let's say we've got a drug where the PK following an IV bolus is best described by a one compartment model. And in this case, I mean that within an individual patient. Uh, so in that case, each individual patient's data would be described by a mono exponential function. But the mean concentration time course for N patients is actually described by a poly exponential with, with as many as N exponential terms. And the qualification there is that's true unless their elimination rate constants are equal. And I just write it out, you know, just write out the equation just to, to bring this home. So you were starting out with a, you know, our simple one compartment model for IV bolus administration. It's described by a uh, by a mono exponential equation. Uh, our parameters here: the uh, rate constant k and volume of distribution v. I've subscripted by i to indicate that uh, they might be individual specific parameters. So the so those are referring to the values of those parameters for the ith individual. But now let's say we take the CI, the concentration and the ith inter, or sorry, the concentration and the ith patient at some particular time. Suppose we've measured that concentration uh, at the same time in several patients, and we take the mean of that. So that's what we're what I'm describing down here is simply the process of taking an arithmetic mean. And notice what we have on the right hand side here is something which is not a mono exponential equation. So the one compartment model does not describe in simple terms the uh, a mean. Uh, instead, you end up with the sum of n exponential terms with possibly different rate constants here. And it, and it won't collapse to a mono exponential except in the special case where the, all of the k's are the same. And that's just illustrating that down here in that special case. So that's just, again, it's just a recognition that just because a mono exponential can describe an individual patient's data, uh, that will not necessarily be a suitable description for, uh, for sample means. 
Uh, we can do a similar thing for an Emacs model where instead of now having a nonlinear function of time, it's a nonlinear function of dose uh, in here. And let's suppose then that uh, the dose response model in an individual patient is, is described by a simple Emacs model, uh, as I've shown it here. Uh, where the parameters are Emacs and the ED50 are potentially different for each individual. Uh, and what we find then, if you try to take the mean of such a response in end patients, the result is no longer described as a simple Emacs model uh, for that. It ends up being more complicated. You can see here you end up with something which would be, in theory, described by a, uh, a sum of, of n different Emacs type terms and that it would only collapse in the special case where the ED50 is the same for all patients. Uh, notice that uh, the Emacs does not cause a similar issue uh, and that's because in this case the Emacs, uh, that, that patient specific parameter enters, the mo enters this linearly in here and that's that's something we'll find over and over again is that again so these models will collapse to the same functional form in the special case where the individual specific parameters enter the model linearly uh, or at least that's now again that's only true for the sample mean and simply because these uh, when we're dealing with a sample mean we're dealing with a sum we're dealing with uh, a simple addition Okay, so that's just, you know, trying to bring out that as an issue when you start thinking about modeling summary data where you may have originally uh, been working with individual data and have conceptualized a model in the context of individual data. Now, so what do you do about that? Uh, well, at the moment, I, you'll see here I'm kind of punting on the issue. Um, and sort of pointing out the problem without necessarily offering a solution at the moment. Uh, as I say, there's no easy remedy for the discrepancy between models for individual and summary data. And the only recommendation I give here is basically one of caution. Uh, as I say here, I'm saying, uh, you know, the uh, recommendation arising from these discrepancies is that any mechanistic interpretations of model structure and parameter values uh, that are derived from a model-based meta-analysis applied to summary data should be approached very cautiously in here. Um, one thing that I can mention is that this is something that uh, that uh, at least a few people are taking a peek at. I know over uh, over the past few years, both Jonathan and I have taken have been exploring a couple approaches for trying to deal with this kind of an issue, um, where instead of well, basically they what we've been looking at are approaches where where we actually are working with models based on individual data and 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 actually trying to construct the likelihoods for our our models by essentially simulating individuals and there's a couple different approaches that uh, that we've been looking at and so far um, well they're still exploring but they raise issues I mean one approach is you could do something like an MCMC simulation in which you calculate the sample statistics in the sim in that simulation by actually simulating the individuals that contribute to that sample mean so you so what you're doing is what you end up with is essentially a very large scale missing data problem where where the individual data is missing but you have some summary of all of the individual data. So you, you simulate all of those uh, within the MCMC simulation construct. And essentially by simulation, you're approximating or, well, I won't even say you're approximating, you're using simulation to describe the, um, the likelihood of the sample statistic. 
is part of this. Now, the the issue here, uh, there's a couple issues that arise, but one of the big ones is just the computational demands. Uh, you, in effect, have to simulate as many patients. Well, for each iteration, you have to simulate as many patients as there were as those that contribute to the summary data that you're looking at. And in many cases, you're talking, well, in most cases, you're talking at least hundreds of patients and potentially thousands of patients when you're doing these model-based meta-analyses. And you're doing that over and over again, typically several thousand times. Uh, the end result is, is fairly extreme computational demands uh, when you try to do this. Uh, and then if in addition you embed that into a Gibbs sampling strategy, Gibbs sampling has some has some properties that that make it particularly difficult because when you simulate a bunch of individual patients, you've now so also exploded the number of of random variables in the model, and all of a sudden the Gibbs sampling becomes extremely cumbersome uh, because it's it's trying to construct all of these random variables as part of that process and include them into the uh, the Gibbs sampling structure. And what we find is when we try to use any general purpose software like bugs, is it tends to kind of grind to a halt. So that's not very effective. In theory, we could probably incorporate those simulations of these thousands of patients in a sort of a massively parallel computation of some kind. Uh, and speed things up. That doesn't solve the Gibbs sampling problem, but at least would do that. And we might want to use a sampler other than the Gibbs sampler also to uh, fix some of the issues. But right now that's a, a research effort that will take a while. Uh, another direction which is conceivably more promising from a computational demand point of view is there's a class of approaches called approximate Bayesian computation. Uh, or ABC as it's commonly been described, uh, which was really developed for other contexts, but it's another one where in effect you simulate uh, the individual patients and construct the uh, the summary statistics from those. And I won't even try to describe exactly what ABC is right now, but it's a it uses something which is a bit simpler and uh, and less computationally demanded demanding than MCMC, at least most of the methods do. Uh, and it might be another approach too. It's one I've been looking at recently. And though conceptually it's attractive uh, in the small number of cases I've attempted so far, it hasn't been that promising. So don't hold your breath. Okay, enough on that. Um, so again, basically, I've just raised an issue without necessarily giving you a solution right now. So let's talk about analysis of longitudinal data, uh, which is loosely related to the issue we just talked about. And I guess in spite of what I just said uh, about the issues of trying to use you know, models based upon individual data to individual data to describe summary data. That's basically what we're going, still what we're going to do. Um, and uh, so I start out with the statement here that to some extent treatment arms may be viewed as sort of super individuals, uh, which is, you know, which is only partially true given the issues I just raised, but at least it's in to some level of approximation, it is true. Uh, and one of the ways in which that's true is like data from individuals within a population analysis, when you have multiple observations, uh, well, let's step back to the individual case. When you're dealing with individual data and if you have longitudinal data within an individual, uh, within an overall population analysis that goes across multiple individuals, each individual's data over uh, is is correlated uh, more so the data within an individual is more correlated with itself than it is with other patients for example and and the way we deal with that is by using these hierarchical or mixed effects models uh, in order to account for that within patient correlation well the same issue arises 
with treatment arms where you have, if you have multiple observations within a treatment arm, again, there are, there are correlations amongst those observations that should be accounted for in it, within an analysis. So that's the second bullet item here. So like data from individuals within a population analysis, multiple observations within a treatment arm are correlated, and we need to deal with that. Uh, and then I comment that that's further complicated that by the fact that treatment arms are not created equal in the same way that individuals are created equal. Uh, and in particular, the sample sizes differ among the treatment arms. Uh, so that, that's one issue. In addition, some treatment arms come from one study, some from another. Uh, so we need to, to also account for things that may be different across studies. Uh, so how do we account for those sources of, of differences here? Uh, and then I just point up there are some publications um, out there that are relevant to the approach that I'll be describing. Uh, those refer to things back in the, uh, actually maybe I'll even identify uh, the ones that are most relevant here. Let me go down to the uh, bibliography. Okay. Okay. Some that are okay. One is uh, the first one here. Um, uh, Jayon and uh, Jayon and uh, and Jonathan uh, had a publication uh, that described an that described an approach, and the approach that we're going to be using is essentially that plus some additional elements. Uh, so that that one is one I certainly recommend to taking a look at. Um, let's see the uh, the particular derivation that I describe here was uh, was presented uh, in this in a poster here at ACOP in 2009. So that's right here. This uh, this one by myself and Jim Rogers, Gary Ito, and Mark. Uh, so that that's where the, uh, the actual derivation that we're going to be looking at comes from. Uh, that was further modified for the specific case of that ADAS cog problem. And let's see that. So that's right here. This one, uh, Jorge Gross, as well as a group of us from Metrum. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's not the one. Du -du 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 -du. Excuse me. Let me move on. Let's see. Who was the lead on that? Was that Jim? Excuse me while I hunt it down. There we go. Uh, it was one the one right here. Yeah, Jim was the uh, the lead author on that one. So this is this is similar to what we're describing here. You can see it's combining patient level and summary level data for Alzheimer's disease modeling and simulation. Um, it's similar to what I'll be describing, except instead of having a um, having a residual variation that's normally distributed, it was using a, a beta distribution to describe uh, values that go over a restricted range. That's the term beta regression meta-analysis. But again, so it's an extension of what we'll be talking about today. So those are the primary ones. Uh, there was another one that I cite there that I'll just mention if I can find it. I forget who the first author was. Let's see. Yeah, it's this one, uh, Ding and Fu. Uh, it was one recently published in StatMed uh, that was sort of a more a, a statistician's view of the same sort of problem, uh, although our criticism of that one is it did not account for within treatment arm correlations, uh, but it's another one describing a somewhat similar type of methodology. Okay, so let's head back to what we're going to do with it. Uh, let's see, probably easier to do it this way. Okay, let's, 
Okay, so let's start out with the first notion here is that we've seen how sample size affects the residual variance, but in addition, it also affects the interarm variance in model parameters. Uh, it's sort of, if you like, the that interarm variance in model parameters is directly analogous to inter-individual variation in population analysis. It's just that the individual in this case is actually a composite of multiple individuals, and the variance itself changes in scale depending upon how many patients. So you can imagine as the sample size for any given treatment arm gets larger and larger, the inter, you know, the interarm variance would tend to be smaller. Uh, and, and that is taken into account for that. So the approach we're going to use here is we're going to use a hierarchical model, as I say here, uh, and we're going to do it with three levels of variation. Uh, the first level is one we've already dealt with in our previous examples, and that's we'll be describing intertrial variation. And, and also we'll have residual variation. So we've seen those already. But now with our longitudinal data, we're also going to have a separate interarm variation term uh, as part of this. So there'll be three levels of variation. Uh, and as I just commented, both the interarm and the residual variances in this should be adjusted for sample size, and we'll see how in the derivation. And the approach I'm going to use for deriving the approach here is to start out with population models for individual data and derive it from that. So we're actually, we are going to start by conceptualizing the model in the context of individual patients here and then build up from there to construct the suitable model for the summary data. Uh, now, when I do this, we find that in the special case where individual data is linear with respect to all of the random effects, actually I should be more careful, it's actually with respect to all of the ARM-specific random effects. Uh, if it's linear with respect to those, uh, and for the special and for the case I'm looking at, this would be where they're also normally distributed. The derivation is exact. Um, it probably wouldn't be too hard to extend this to the non-normal case, depending upon what distributions we're talking about. But we'll start there. Uh, now, for the general nonlinear case, the approach is an approximation. Uh, and there would be variations on the approximation that we use that uh, that could be attempted. But for now, we'll, I'll describe a specific one. So let's start uh, going through the nuts and bolts here. So let's take a look at the linear case as a starting point. Uh, and the main reason I go through this is because when we go to the nonlinear case, we can borrow what we learned from this rather than having to re-derive re it all from scratch. So let's start by considering a model that's linear with respect to interpatient uh, and the residual random effects. Uh, and and has a normally distributed residual interpatient and interstudy variation. So that's our starting point. Uh, for our symbolism here, I'm going to use Y sub I, J, K to refer to the an observed variable on the ith occasion in the jth patient in the kth study. And we're going to have normally distributed residual variation. So that's our first relationship here. So we've got some uh, mean value here and a variance term. Uh, and I've put a subscript K on the variance to allow for the possibility that we might have intertrial variation in that value. Uh, then for that mean observed value here, and I say mean, this is this is a conditional mean. It's conditioned on the individual's uh, random uh, random effects here. Uh, is some function of of time 
other covariates, for example, that could include dose, you know, patient specific characteristics, you know, and so on. Uh, our fixed effects parameters that I'll call theta, and then our random effects. And we've got that described as, a, in this case, they look like H and K. I guess uh, I'm thinking of them actually as capital eta and, uh, and kappa here. So H, our, our eta JK then is our collection of individual specific random effects. So that's values in the jth patient in the kth trial. The kappa is the collection of trial specific random effects. Now, we may, I said we started out with the assumption that the model's linear with respect to the interpatient and residual random effects. And if that's true, then I can rewrite this function, um, assuming it's linear with respect to actually what now, we've already pulled out the, uh, uh, our, our residual component here. So I'm assuming this is going to be linear with respect to the components of this, uh, of this eta vector here. Uh, and so I can rewrite it as shown right here. By the way, if you lose track of the symbolism, I've got it described down, down here. Oh, and just to point out, I'm using sort of non-mem-like conventions here where uh, for my random effects here, the kappa and the eta, I'm assuming they're centered at zero. So my, you know, whereas my fixed effects are described by the, by the theta in this case. Uh, so I can rewrite the model in terms of some function here, which is sort of our, our if you like, you can think of it as our intercept with respect to the uh, random effects. Uh, and then we've got a bunch of terms here, all multiplying the various components of our eta distribution here. So you can see I'm assuming that our, our eta here consists of, is a vector of n sub eta values. Uh, and here, so we're just taking, making that a linear function. It does not need to be linear with respect to the trial specific random effects. So those are still left in these unspecified functions here. Okay, so once we have it described that way, I can, oh, and just to remind you here, what I'm looking at here so far is we're still writing a model for our individual patient data. Now what I want to do is take this individual model and convert it to a model to describe our sample mean and sample variance uh, term in here. So I can use it to describe our, our aggregate data. Okay, so that's the, what I'm going to do is describe the modifications of the model to deal with sample mean and variance. Okay, so since our original YIs, IJKs, are normally distributed, the sample mean of those values uh, is also going to be normal in here, uh, where we've got so our sample mean is going to be nor is going to be normal with a variance term here. Uh, which is now adjusted for sam appropriately adjusted for sample size. Uh, our our y hat term here is now different from what it was before because it too is a mean over the 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 components of that. Uh, sorry, over the various components here, and in particular, we're going to be taking into account our interarm variation. So in particular, it's going to be a function. It's going to be the same functional form we had before, but where instead of having the eta here, we're actually going to have a mean. So this is now is actually a, a mean of the, of the individual level random effects in here. And so you can see that described down here. So in that, now, of course, it's a mean of things that already had a mean of zero. So the overall mean of that is still going to be zero. Uh, we have it over here, but our variances are all going to be adjusted for the sample size. 
So again, I, so again, I have to divide that by the sample size. And that now is going to describe our arm-specific random effects in here. So again, it's got the same functional form, but with a uh, but with the original ADA replaced by one representing an average. Uh, and then the form of the function that takes, since it started out as a linear function, when you actually write it out, it's going to, again, have the same functional form that we had for the individual, except when we take a mean over that thing, we're going to end up with a, a mean over our individual random effects here. So our inter-arm random effect is nothing more than the mean of the inter-individual random effects. Again, that ends up being centered around zero. So that becomes the form of the model that we would then fit to sample mean data. So it's actually fairly straightforward. We actually end up with the same functional form as we did before. Uh, the thetas end up being the same as they were for individuals. Actually, also the kappas, there are inter-trial random effects here. What changes is the residual variance term and the variance associated now, instead of having inter-individual variation, we have inter-arm variation, which are closely related, and it is, in fact, the same as the inter-individual, except with, an, with a variance adjusted for sample size. That, in a sense, was sort of the easy part. Uh, the tougher part that we had uh, done originally uh, was to also try and figure out how to do the same thing if we wanted to incorporate uh, our sample variance information in here. Uh, so how do we come up with a descriptor for, for a random effect there? Uh, I'm sorry, a descriptor for the likelihood in this case. Well, we had, we, this one I actually sort of, uh, the, the original derivation is a bit lengthier, so I'm basically just giving you the result. But we, what we end up with, in fact, I won't even describe the first part of this because it's, it ends up being pretty cryptic without seeing the rest of the derivation. But what you find when you work work the whole thing out is that our is that we end up with a sort of a normalized sample variance as I describe here. So normalized meaning the s squared is the sample variance, uh, and normalized in the sense I adjust for some variance term here, which I term a the uh, sigma squared marginal and an adjustment for sample size, that that quantity is going to be chi squared with n minus one degrees of freedom. Uh, and then you can turn that around and we end up with the kind of form that we've dealt with uh, with before. You end up where the sample variance is gamma distributed with n minus one over two uh, for the first parameter and for the second it's n minus one over two times this marginal uh, this marginal variance term here. Um, but this sigma squared marginal is not the original sigma squared describing only the variance for the uh, residual variation. Uh, this, this is a marginal variation, which is this variance of y conditioned on the study. Uh, and when you can't figure that out, it ends up being a relatively complicated term, uh, taking into account all those components from our individual patient model here. Uh, so this is attempting to go through the derivation uh, for what that looks like. Uh, and I'll just go to sort of the bottom line here. We end up with a term that looks like this. So it's a function not only of the residual variance term in here, but it also ends up being a function of the inter-arm variance term multiplied by the, oh, actually, I'm sorry, this is the, uh, when I say I said variance, it's actually, it's 
it's a covariance term, which for some of the component, for some of the uh, elements here will actually be the variance. So you can see it's omega LM. So it's the LM, LM uh, component of the omega matrix in here. Uh, and you can see we've got all the cross products in here uh, going over the entire going over the entire matrix contributing to this marginal variance component in here uh, so so it's a little more complicated to calculate that component but it's still basically just algebra uh, because you have those various components of that original model function in here multiplying uh, the various components from the omega matrix um, so, so we end up with that. And now in the special case where our, our omega is just a diagonal matrix, it simplifies a bit. And you can see that here in that special case, basically all of the uh, off diagonal terms go away and you just end up with something which is a linear function of the both the residual variance and the interarm variance components here. Okay, so in the case where we're actually going to be now, we only you only have to do this part of the calculation if you're also going to incorporate the sample variances as part of your modeling effort. If you're only doing the sample means, uh, you only have to worry about the components that are here. Okay, uh, actually, before I go to the nonlinear case, let me. Uh, let me stop here, and uh, you may have you got any any questions or, or comments on this part before I add a few more complications in. Actually, while I'm doing that, I'm going to. Gonna, let's see take the screen offline for a second and just make sure that uh, nobody's trying to rattle my chains here to see see what's up here I was just checking my email to make sure that nobody's saying they can't reach us for some reason that I have could influence Okay, well, anyway, it doesn't look like anybody there. Okay, I guess I will just keep on going then. Okay, so so we've got our basic notion here. The main thing is, you know, adjusting our our inter-individual variance to uh, to make it to essentially create a term for inter-arm variance. Okay, let's move on to the nonlinear case. So now we've got, it's a more general case. The model may be nonlinear with respect to the interpatient. And uh, did I do it with respect? To, okay, with respect to the interpatient and uh, residual random effects and has normally distributed residual interpatient and interstudy variation. So... I'm still going to actually say, actually, I think I left the residual random effects linear now that I said this here, uh, but it is now potentially nonlinear with respect to the interpatient random effects. So now we're just going to have our uh, residual component here is normal, and our model is now, you know, is now 
potentially nonlinear, so I'm not going to have this collapse to a linear case any longer. Uh, parameters and everything are all defined as before, the kappa, the eta's, and so on. It's just that we end up with, uh, with no ability to simplify this or describe it in terms of a linear model any longer. So what I want to do is I want to take advantage of what we've already sort of learned for the linear case. So what I'm going to do is approximate this nonlinear model. Um, you know, or I'm, well, I'm going to approximate certain aspects of this model in terms of uh, in terms of a Taylor series. So I end up with something which is linear with respect to the random effects. So as I say here, approximate equations for our sampling distributions of the sample means and variances are derived by approximating the model using a first order Taylor series. Uh, now it is possible to go to higher order Taylor series. Um, and in fact, I believe, I don't think he's published it yet. Uh, Jonathan and a coworker I know had been playing around with going to a second order series, uh, but you, you certainly could uh, try and make the approximation better. But anyway, for now we'll stick with the first order and then we'll derive the relationships just like we described for the linear case once we've done that, because in effect we will be creating a linear model with respect to the random effects. So we're gonna begin by approximating uh, our conditional mean for individual patients with that first order Taylor series, uh, where these inter patient random effects then are expanded out about their expected values. And those expected values are just zero. Okay, so we start out with our basic model. So we're going to approximate it then uh, in terms of right here, which is again, our first order Taylor series relative to the uh, interpatient random effects. And in this case, this F sub eta sub M here is the derivative of our model function with respect to that random effect, eta sub M. Now, once we have that, we can proceed just like we did for the linear case uh, and construct uh, a strategy for dealing with that. So I'm going to have my uh, my yij cat ijk mean here. So my sample mean is just going to be normal with sample size adjusted variance term here. Uh, for my sample variance, again, I end up with a gamma uh, with this. Uh, sigma squared marginal term as part of this. My y hat i, j, k, uh, I'm going to, now for, for actually calculating the y hat, I'm not gonna use the linear approximation. Uh, for that, I'm just gonna use the original model function as it is, uh, where the approximation comes up is in the manner in which we adjust the random effects. For the nonlinear case, um, the, the bit of using normal with the simple sample size adjusted random effect is not an exact result. It's an approximation. Uh, but, you know, so we're going to do that. In addition, well, actually using F, I forget, is an approximation too, because when we're talking about a mean of the individual data, that is also not, since we're taking a mean of all these nonlinear functions, the the result for the sample mean would not be the identical functional form in that case, as we described for the simple examples I gave you earlier. Uh, so again, that is still an approximation in a sense, even though we're using exactly the same functional form. Okay, anyway, so again, for my inter-arm random effects, uh, it's basically just a mean of our inter-individual random effects, so I have to adjust the uh, the variance uh, in terms of the sample size. Uh, and then that Taylor series approximation crops up again in dealing with that sigma squared marginal that fits into the uh, likelihood for the sample variance. And you can see that here. Again, it has the same form we had before, except 
that in here, instead of these being those components of that linear function that we had in the first case, they're actually the partial derivatives with respect to the, um, the random effects. So, and what do I go? Oh, and this is just showing you again how that simplifies in the case where, um, where uh, omega is just a diagonal matrix. Okay, so that's that's basically. I think that's pretty much. Okay, so that's that's most of the story here. That's the mathematical part of the story, anyway. Um, now, again, because this is nonlinear, and we've used an approximation, uh, there you know there are potential inaccuracies that come up, much like you end up with some inaccuracies that crop up when you use, um, you know when you use the first order method in something like non-mem. Uh, so that is a potential issue here. So I just have a few comments about that approximation uh, that we're going to use to deal with our sample mean and variance. So when the individual data model is not linear with respect to the interpatient random effects, the sampling distributions that we're using here are being approximated in three senses. One, the sampling distributions are approximated as normal for the mean, for the mean and gamma for the variance. The conditional expectation for the treatment mean is approximated using the individual data model in which the variances of the interarm random effects are sample size adjusted for interpatient variances. And again, as we've seen before, when you have a model which is nonlinear with respect to those random effects, a, the individual data model does not collapse to uh, or does not collapse to the same functional form for the sample statistics. Uh, and then finally, for our marginal variance, we've used the so-called delta method uh, to approximate that as part of there. So there's uh, there are various elements of approximation here, and I just comment here that some additional research is really required to assess the extent to which those approximations may adversely affect our model-based inferences. Uh, so in particular, uh, it would be good to make some effort where we actually do some simulations based upon, ind basically simulate individual patient data, simulate trials, and and assess how these approximations do when we apply them uh, in the context of model-based meta-analysis. Uh, that effort has not been done. Okay, so let's move on to actually applying it. Actually, again, let me take a take a breath here. I think yeah, we're actually going to go on to a specific example. See if there's any questions before I move on to that. Okay, well, why don't I go ahead and uh, let's take a look at an example. Uh, so the example I'm going to use is we're going to do model-based meta-analysis of a measure of cognitive function uh, commonly used to assess the efficacy of potential treatments for Alzheimer's disease, and it's known as ADAS-COG. Uh, I'm not going to try and remember what the acronym stands for, but the ADAS is an acronym. Of course, COG is just a reference to cognition. Um, so we're going to have a, uh, here I'll give you sort of a hypothetical scenario here. So let's suppose that you're involved in the development of one or more new potential drug treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as I say, the ADAS-COG scores commonly used as a measure of Alzheimer's disease symptoms in clinical trials, so it's commonly it's commonly used as a as the primary endpoint in such trials. 
um, and a model of ADAS cog time course during treatment with placebo or marketed drugs would be useful to support dis decision making regarding things like trial designs, dose selection, and potentially go no go uh, decisions during drug development. So, so the idea is to help support that effort, we're going to develop a model to describe ADAS COG over time in patients with Alzheimer's disease participating in such trials. Uh, the data we're going to start with are going to be post baseline sample means and sample variances for ADAS COG change from baseline. They come from various published sources. Uh, the data that we're going to use here, we've actually posted uh, at a website we call opendiseasemodels.org. So you can actually go out and get, uh, get the data there. Uh, so we've got that data uh, for what I've given you here. I've, mod I've simplified the data structure a bit to, so we don't have to do as much data management uh, in the work we're going to do here. Uh, the data came from 55 studies containing 114 treatment arms. So here I've just pointed out, so we've got 400, and of course it's longitudinal data, so for, or for most of these it's longitudinal, so for most of those treatment arms we will have more than one observation within, within the arm. Uh, I've got 465 sample means, 263 sample variances, in other words, we don't have sample variances corresponding to all the means, just a subset of them. Uh, and the data actually reflects the result from some uh, 16,000 plus patients and 68,000 some observations in here. Uh, our objective is going to be to construct a model for ADAS cog change from baseline as a function of drug, daily dose, time, and possibly other covariates. Uh, the data file, th this is an example the, that you should have in the, the set I distributed, uh, and, you can, and it just points up the, uh, the data file itself. It's in a directory called ADAS COG, and the name of the data set is ADAS COG data.csv. Just a few exploratory plots here just to so you have some idea what the data is looking like so in these we're looking at uh, mean ADAS cog change from baseline versus time in here uh for and there's different drugs represented here so we've got let's see what do we got we've got three three drugs here denepazil galantamine and uh rivastamine uh, so, and you can see in these that, you know, you've got a range of things here. Oh, also you can see we've got, uh, uh, legends here. So for example, if we look at black on, uh, let's see, on left-hand panels, black is the placebo. Um, you can see at least within the time frames we've got here, and these are, see, are these weeks? Five, ten. Notice I've got it marked weeks. I may need to check that because it seems like a short time on that one, but uh, they're a little hard to read here because they've kind of jumbled together a little bit here. Uh, but what you tend to see is that in placebo, you, you tend to see a rise uh, over time uh, on those. So on the right-hand side, they're in purple. We actually don't have a lot of placebo data over here. Uh, what about here? Let's see, it's gray. We do have a, no, it is green, I'm sorry. Eh, not a lot, got a little bit here. Uh, and then, oh, wrong way, there we go, coming back. Uh, we also have, a, you know, some denepazil at various doses. Uh, the 10 milligram dose here, the 10 milligram per day is, is the most commonly used, and thus you'll see that represented in most of these. Uh, the change in, uh, one of the issues here is ADAS cog is something that in patients with Alzheimer's is, is going to, well, they're, they're, it's a progressive disorder, so things will tend to get worse. Uh, the way ADAS cog is, is the greater it is, the worse uh, the patient's condition. Uh, these are all changed from baseline. 
So you'll see patterns like you do down here. These are particularly long. These are going out over about like three years in these lat bottom two panels here on the left. Uh, so you can you get to see the uh, uh, the progression of the disease here. So what you see is here's zero. So initially you get some benefit uh, benefit from the denepazil relative to your uh, starting point, but you can see the disease continues to progress over time. Let's see, I don't think there's a whole lot more to say about those. Uh, and then we've got, these are the standard deviations, uh, the sample standard deviations uh, for our ADAS cog change from baseline. Not a lot to say there, but we also have longitudinal information there. Notice also the standard deviations are going up over time on average here. Okay, so let's take a look at the model that we're going to consider here. Uh, the model we're using is one that um, the core model goes back to work that um, uh, some folks at Pfizer did, uh, Kara Ito in particular. Uh, I think it was the person most responsible for constructing uh, constructing the model that we're going to be we're using here, or at least the core of the model for this. Uh, and that in turn was influenced by some work done a number of years ago by by Nick Holford uh, quite a while back. So uh, let's start out again. We're going to start out by conceptualizing the model in terms of individual patient data. Uh, and for our ADOS cog change from baseline. And so again, we're going to use I to refer to occasion, uh, J to patient and K for study. So our ADAS cog change from baseline is going to be normal uh, about some mean for that change from baseline and some variance term. Uh, that, that conditional mean, we're going to have a disease progression component here. So we've got a slope times time. Uh, the slope might may have some inter-individual variability here. Uh, we've got a placebo effect. This is actually a function I'll describe in a second. And then we've got our, our drug effect component here uh, and a uh, some interpatient variation on the uh, on the intercept. Actually, how did I describe this? Yeah, let me just take a look at my next thing here. Just reminding myself of what I was doing on something. Okay. So anyway, so we're and so we've got these components now for the placebo effect. Uh, we use the uh, abatement function here uh, to describe that. So basically, the notion here is that if you give a placebo uh, in patients with Alzheimer's and you you observe them following uh, the dose for the for a first usually relatively short period of time, what you'll tend to see is they will show some initial benefit so it'll tend to so that so you'll tend to see the uh, ADAS cog go down a bit somewhat gradually and then gradually come back again uh, to the original trend line in here so this is an attempt to capture that that little blip in there uh, and then the drug effect uh, component here is a sigmoid emax model actually i'm sorry i'm saying this incorrectly it's it's actually using a a hyperbolic function yeah, it's not sigmoid either sorry it's using a hyperbolic function for the effect of time in here so you can see we've got this e delta term multiplying time over an et 50 times time so it's not a it's not a like an emax model of, of of dose it's more like an emax model of time in here uh, and you can see there's a random effect component on here in this case it's an inter-trial random effect not inter-individual 
uh, and then the drug effect, the, the, so, uh, well, this component here allows for the drug effect to come on gradually over time. So that's the, what's going on with that. And then over here, we have a component describing the effect of dose or the dose response component. And that's, we've got the dose of our drug divided by some reference dose, all raised to a, uh, raised to a power in here. So that style of a function can allows for both a linear linear and potentially nonlinear relationships in here. Uh, but there wasn't enough data to support the more complicated uh, a more complicated Emacs type function to describe the effect of dose. So a few components uh, that reference dose is different for each one of the drugs. Uh, we've got five for denepazil, 24 for galantamine, six for uh, rivastamine in here. Uh, also the ET50s are allowed to be different for the different drugs, uh, as well as that gamma term in the, uh, in the dose response function. Uh, we've got some, uh, additional complications here and that my random effects uh, when we did this work originally a normal random effect didn't quite seem to capture it there were a uh, there were a num the the shape of the distribution for our random effects often appeared to have some fairly fat tails on them so we ended up resorting to a t distribution so rather than using normal distributions here, I've incorporated T distributions. So in addition to having a, a mean and a variance component, there is a degree of freedom uh, component to the, to the model. Uh, and we've got, so we've got inter-individual random effects in the intercept. There's also an inter-trial random effect on that. We've got uh, a inter-individual random effect on on the um, on the slope, as well as an inter-trial random effect on that. We have an inter-trial random effect on that that the overall magnitude of the drug effect, and then uh, and then finally we allowed for inter-trial variation in the residual variation term. So a number of little complications as part of this. So that was just describing the model for individuals, but of course we don't have individuals. We have to use the approach we talked about to deal with, uh, with uh, our summary stats. So that's what's going on here. Uh, so we have, as we described before, we've got our normal component with suitable sample size adjustment here. And then we have our random, our, uh, sorry, our sample variance here, again, is gamma, and we have to work out that uh, marginal variance term here. Uh, here I describe that. For the specific model we did, there are no, uh, we didn't, sorry, we just used a, uh, a diagonal omega here, so we ended up with a relatively simple relationship here. Uh, for uh, the other terms here, we uh, adjusted the variance term uh, within the for the inter individual effects to get inter arm treatment effects. Uh, I should probably make a comment here since we used a t distribution. We're actually doing another approximation here. Uh, the approximation we used for the normal case is not strictly applicable to the t distribution. Uh, so we've actually got another uh, sort of approximation when we've incorporated the T in here. Uh, but it should be a relatively tolerable one. Okay, so now we actually have to apply this mess and, uh, and pull it into a bugs language form. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So this will all be under the ADAS COG directory. 
Oops. Just open the wrong thing. So where'd it go again? There we go. So let's take a look at the what we have to do with the model itself. May as well go ahead and open up the R uh, script while we're at it too. Things a bit bigger. Okay, now so far we've only looked at cases where we had sort of two levels of random variation. We had some sort of, uh, we had intertrial and residual. Now we're going to have three. Uh, and the approach that we use to introduce the second one by having an intertrial, we just extend that one more. So now we actually have uh, three separate four blocks in here. Uh, one, the top one here is corresponding to our intertrial variation. The next one corresponds to the interarm variation. And then finally, the last one is now looping over the individual observations in here. Uh, so, well, let's take a look at, let's take a look at the observation level first here. So in here, one of the first things we're going to have is just the uh, our likelihood for our sample mean. Uh, so we've got, and I used ADAS CFB to refer to the ADAS cog change from baseline. Sorry, I didn't notice a comment we had. We have screen is frozen from your side. Ah, interesting. Let's ask a question. <laughs> uh, I see you told me the answer to my question before I even asked it here. Let's see. So you're seeing 218. It means you're certainly not seeing 218. That's a long time ago. Where's that 216? Okay, just to confirm, so does that mean you're looking at the slide that's headed up linear case modifications for sample mean and variance? And well, you're the only other one on the line, so it's 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 you or nobody, so Interesting. Okay, so apparently you've been getting the audio. So that's actually like... Let's see, so that means you've been stuck... That's uh, like 12 slides ago. Hmm... I'm trying to think what I could do to break it loose here. Um, you 
Yeah, well, that's a question of whether or not the recording is, ca I think the recording is capturing it locally, uh, but I can't swear to that. Let me, uh, oh, actually, it was something sillier. I just forgot to put the uh, thing. Actually, the uh, recording probably did not capture it. Um, I'm not sure whether it does when I no longer show the screen, but I suspect it doesn't. Uh, I actually uh, had taken it off and forgot to put it back on uh, the ability to view the screen. Uh, I may have to go back and just check the recording later and find out whether we've got it. Uh, just to make sure you know where we've been. So let's see, we were all the way back on 216. So of course I stepped through the slides pertaining to the nonlinear case. And then we're jumping into, so I went through all those and now we're going into the, the example. Actually, let me confirm. Are you able to see? Uh, I've got it, what, on slide 223 at the moment. Are you able to see that? Okay. Yeah, that was my mistake. Uh, okay. Well, why don't we run with that for the time being here? I may end up having to re record the session here. Okay. So, again, so let me just maybe quickly step through these. So we're going to, we're going to be looking at uh, 8S COG. Actually, let's get to the specific case here. So we're going to be looking at 8S COG change from baseline. Uh, and we're looking, going, to, we're going to have both sample means and sample variances for that, for those. Uh, we've got the data set in the 8S COG folder. Uh, I went through the uh, uh, EDA, the exploratory data analysis here, and just sort of stepped through those. Uh, and the model then is one where we've got the 8S COG, well, the, the individual patient model is where we've got the 8S COG change from baseline uh, as normally distributed residual variation, that the conditional mean is a linear term with respect to time plus components for placebo effect, drug effect, and, uh, and an intercept term uh, in here, or which has, and we have uh, some random effects and various components here we'll hit on in a second. Uh, so this basically is a model describing a, I guess what we could call a, a symptomatic effect. It doesn't affect the drug, doesn't affect the slope. It's only affecting uh, the intercept in effect. Uh, we've got a placebo component, which is a bi exponential that basically starts at zero, would drop, usually beta would be negative, so it would tend to drop and then rises back to the general trend of the overall curve. Uh, and then the e drug component is we've got a basically an exponential model for the dose response and then a Emacs style function describing the effect of time. Uh, and then just various components here, that DREF term is a fixed value for the different uh, and different for each one of the drugs. Uh, the ET50 is allowed to be drug of, drug specific, but that's an estimated parameter. Uh, we've got random effects, and here I'm actually, instead of a normal distribution, using T distributions to try and capture the, the heavy tailed quality that we seem to get. Uh, certainly in the original development, a, a normal was tried, but the, um, the estimated random effects seemed to have pretty heavy tails, so I ended up using T distributions. Uh, and for that, uh, and the main ones, the intercept and the slope have both intertrial and, uh, and interarm, or actually we're still talking about the individual patient. So it's inter-individual and interarm, I'm sorry, inter-individual and intertrial random effects. Uh, the drug effect random effect, we only have an inter-trial uh, inter random effect on it. 
and then adjusting for uh, for doing the aggregate data, the sample mean and sample variance uh, for the residual component. Uh, pretty much same as before, except we adjust for sample size and the variance. Uh, and then for the samples variance term here, again, it's gamma with this uh, sigma squared marginal term, which is uh, a function of not only the residual variance component, but both of the uh, inter-individual uh, random effect components too uh, are part of that. Uh, one thing to notice here is if you recall back in the the exploratory plots, there was some indication that the um, that that standard deviation increased with time, and lo and behold, when we actually construct the model this way, we actually do end up with a time component uh, as part of this. So that seems consistent with the model that we have. Uh, and then we've got our inter individual, what it were inter individual random effects now become inter arm random effects with appropriate adjustments for sample size. Okay, so now let's get back to um, where we're going with the files. Okay, so as I was uh, pointing out here, <clears throat> we've got three levels of random effects and there's going to be three for loops corresponding to those three random effects. We've got where we're gonna loop over our trials, we're gonna loop over our treatment arms, and we're gonna loop over observations. Uh, the sort of our basic likelihoods for our sample mean here, so that's again, it's just normal. Uh, in here with some mean and some precision, and the precision shows up uh, down here, so and this n pad is the number of patients, so that's our sample size. So we have this tau study component here is what we sort of conceptualize as the inter is well that would be the residual variance for an individual, but then we have or precision in this case, and that has to be appropriately adjusted for sample size. And then for our a sample variance term, <coughs> excuse me, sample variance, it's gamma, and the two parameters are calculated right here, excuse me. Ah, a little tickle back in the throat there. Um, it's much like we did before when we were working with these, but now for the uh, the second one here, I've got this marginal precision term here corresponding to that marginal variance that we mentioned in the in the slides, and we have to calculate that, and that's what's going on right up here. So this is actually the reciprocal of where to go here that tau marginal is just the reciprocal of the sigma squared marginal right here. And you can see the various components we have that are, you know, the, so we've got a separate precisions here. So this tau alpha and the tau intercept, which are actually the reciprocals of the variances associated with those inter-individual random components. And finally, the overall residual. Let's see, what are other parts of the story that we need to tell? Well, we've got you know, our the calculation of our basic model structure. So that's our alpha times time, uh, our intercept random effect, uh, placebo effect, and our drug effect. Uh, you can see the alpha here unit by the way i used as unit is a um i suppose i could have called it arm so unit just refers to arm i'm actually sort of presaging here a bit 
what we'll be doing when we try to combine individual and summary data together, where I just tried to use unit as kind of a ambiguous term that could mean either a treatment arm or an individual patient, but in our context, it means a treatment arm. Uh, so that's going to be a, an arm specific random effect, our alpha, ditto for the this eta intercept term here. And then for e for our placebo effect, we calculate that right here. So that's our bi exponential term. Um, and then for our drug effect, we've got that right down here. So that's that thing where we've got. Let's see, where's the uh, the dose? So we've got the dose part here. So this is our dose over d ref to uh, to the gamma in here. Excuse me, and then we've got that sort of Emax function of time component right here. Uh, let's see, yeah, there's stories to tell. So that's that's the core of that. Um, rest of them have to do with posterior prediction, so we'll come back to that. Uh, then we've got our, well, we'll start at the top. At the top, we've got some intertrial variation in uh in various components so we've got intertrial variation in the intercept term uh there was an intertrial variation in a drug random effect and in the slope in addition we had intertrial variation in the excuse me intertrial variation in the residual variance and that's going on there so that's that's dealing with all our intertrial variation. Uh, then those end up, well, it depends which one. Some of those end up serving as as means to the uh, to the interarm variation components in here. And recall that we were using t distributions for some of these. So that's why you see dt instead of d norm. Uh, they still use, uh, that is still done in terms of precision. So we've got for our interarm variation in the intercept. So we've got our mean, but now this is not the overall mean. It's the study specific mean. And thus we have a, uh, we have to have an index thing here. So which we actually have to provide in the data. So somewhere in the data, we have to tell it uh, which treatment arm a particular observation corresponds to. So we'll look at that when we look at the R script. Uh, and then notice we've also got a degrees of freedom we have to deal with here too. Uh, alpha, same basic story. That's our slope component. Um, and these are just our sample size adjustments for the uh, for the variances for those components. Uh, the last two here are just doing the same thing, but for our posterior predictions, or so-called population predictions. Okay, let's see, is that all the pieces? Basically, other than, uh, you know, we've got, you know, again, various things for the population predictions. Uh, so we're doing simulations both at the study level as well as at the treatment arm level here to get our posterior predictions. Uh, and down here, you can see we've got our, what we've been terming sort of individual predictions, or in this case, again, it's the predicting new observations in the same trial. Uh, and then down here, uh, we have to redo a number of the calculations uh, where we're calculate where we're predicting new observations in a new trial or so-called population predictions. So all of those complications we talked about are captured uh, in that collection of code. Uh, and then the rest of this is our priors on this uh, that I don't think I'll spend a lot of time on. Uh, let's see, are there any particular things I want to bring out? Um, Uh, well, there are things you might want to take a look at. I don't know that I want to bring them out in detail. And, uh, you know, they're the kinds of things that you might want to take a look at. And if you have questions about them, maybe we can talk about them during the lab session. Uh, 
when I tried to fit that bi-exponential uh, that describes a placebo response using the original parameterization, there was a lot of autocorrelation that seemed to be secondary to correlation amongst the parameters. So I reparameterized it in terms of essentially the area under the curve of that by exponential equation. Uh, and uh, so I did it in terms of that one, one of the um, rate constants, and then the other one was the difference between that. So by doing that one, I'm forcing the, the order uh, of these. So I'm basically forcing uh, KEQ here to be greater than KEL. So that helps. And the second thing that helps is by using AUC instead of using the coefficient that multiplies it, which turned out to be extremely correlated with both of the rate constants. So that, that was done to help the MCMC estimation behavior. So that's one little trick going on in there. Um, I used the truncated Emacs reparameterization also to reduce autocorrelation in the drug effect and or the time effect parameters actually here. Uh, and the rest of it's pretty much similar to the kinds of things we've done in the past. So let's see, not much to bring out there. Uh, the one complication that in terms of setting up the R script here, I guess the main one is uh, having to come up with different kinds of indices as part of it. Let's go ahead and pull that up here. Let's see. Uh, most of the, the the top part here is much the same sort of bookkeeping we've done in the past. We've got the model name up here. Uh, let's see. Just reading in the data set. Uh, I need, you know, uh, sequential sets of integers describing our study ID and unit ID as part of this, um, because that's basically what we're going to be looping over for some of this. Um, uh, the original data set had things in terms of the names, denepazil, galantamine, riv rivastigmine. Uh, I changed those to a set of numbers, basically one, two, and three corresponding to those. Where did I generate the? Oh, okay. These are the uh, things up here. I, the study unit uh, is where I basically provide a study ID to describe for a given treatment arm which study that treatment arm comes from. That's included. Where'd it go here? Yeah, right down here. So that's what we use for one of those indices. Again, it's basically more bookkeeping than it is science. Uh, let's see, I guess I got mildly fancy around some of the initial estimates here by introducing some truncated normal distributions for some of that. That was probably overkill. Uh, probably could have done it simpler in some of these, um, but it, and I did that in some of these cases where uniform distributions were used for prior distributions so that I didn't end up with any initial estimates that were outside the bounds of those parameters. And this again is all the same sort of game, identifying which parameters you want to capture, which you want to monitor. And I'm actually not going to run this directly because this one, uh, the examples we've done so far run in relatively few seconds to a small number of minutes. This one takes, I didn't actually measure how long it takes, but it, it certainly takes tens of minutes. And I don't think you want to stand there, sit there just watching uh, wind bugs go along here. Uh, while we're here during the class, but I would encourage you to go ahead and try to run it yourself just so you get some idea of that. 
So why don't we just go ahead and jump to the results. Which I've already got here. Um, why don't we start by taking a look at the basic diagnostics on our fit when we look at some of our parameters. Uh, remember I used a um, a truncated Emax reparameterization for that Emax component here. That's where these Bs are coming from in here. Those aren't too bad. Um, that AUC placebo, that was from the placebo effect component. You can see that still has a fair amount of autocorrelation. There's no gross um, uh, convergence problems. All three of the chains are more or less intertwined with each other. But if I really wanted to get a good estimate of that, I should probably do uh, several more samples on this. Alpha mean, too, that's our slope. The mean for our slope also has a fair amount here. So, so these don't look terrible, but uh, they're basically telling me I probably don't have enough samples for high precision. You know, same thing for a couple of these in here. Yeah, the, the so-called E-star terms uh, very much de definitely need more to have good precision. So basically, this is a good trial run, but if I was doing a production run, I should probably do at least on the order of 10 times more. We'll take a look at the uh, at the parameter summary table at the effect of ends to get a better idea on that. But at least I don't see any serious convergence problems, just inadequate number of samples. Okay, so you can kind of see these. Um, interesting things maybe to spot in here is B3. I need to double check what that is, but I believe that's associated with the rivastamine uh, component that describes the time course. Uh, that's basically, I think I used a uniform 0, 100 for the prior. Basically, we got back the prior. So it says the data told us almost nothing about that parameter. Uh, so that that's kind of you know so that's kind of a diagnostic there uh, of a potential issue that the data is just inadequate to support that parameter. Okay, we've got again our various convergence things uh, because of some of the the way some of those were uh, still had a lot of autocorrelation. Some of these don't, some aren't bad, but some of them don't look so hot. Uh, this is just showing you some of the fits. Um, probably would have been better to use. Unfortunately, I used the same x-axis for all of these. So some of these, it's kind of hard to see um, because this basically is stretched out over three years uh, in here. But I've got these are posterior medians and 90% prediction intervals about uh, the observed values. Uh, there's so much data in some of these, it's hard to see the curves, but you can get some idea on those. So the solid curves are the posterior medians, the dashed ones are the, the bounds on the 90% credible intervals. So it's kind of captured the basic elements of there, but it's kind of hard to see detail on this particular picture. I think I actually cut them down to, I think I've got somewhere I'm looking at the detail over the first uh, for a few weeks in a minute here. But let's see, why don't we scoot through that? Let's see. Oh, I forgot we didn't notice we're actually alternating between means and standard deviations. This is the, the standard deviation values here. Uh, these are okay. Galantamine, Rivastamine. Yeah, you can kind of see why we could, it didn't have enough information about time here. We, we, most of the studies only had one post baseline sample, so there just wasn't enough information to really support uh, as complex a function as that to describe the time effect. Okay, okay, yeah, here I narrowed it down to the first 12 weeks, or, so this is kind of a blow-up of that first period, so you can get a better idea on how well it's capturing 
that period. You can see this sort of shape uh, in this one here. It's not as obvious in some of the others where you can see curves that are sort of going down and then back up. That's, that pro that's a consequence of that bi-exponential equation describing the, uh, the placebo effect. Uh, generally, we capture most of the data within the prediction intervals on these. Uh, those, by the way, were the individual predictions. Now we're looking at the population predictions, which are quite a bit broader, you can see. And you can see the sort of fanning out because we've got inter-individual variation on the slope. As a result, the uh, our posterior predictions will have will get uh, the prediction intervals get wider and wider because of that variation in the slope over time. And let's just kind of scoot right through those. Uh, the rest of these are diagnostics on the um, random effects. For instance, here we're looking at the, the this is the intertrial random effect on the intercept looking at both a histogram and a QQ plot. Uh, these, by the way, in this case, it's QQ compared to uh, a T distribution, not compared to the normal, as I recall. Yeah. So anyway, I wasn't going to spend time on those, but you may want to explore the implications because in addition to that, I did a few things looking at, you know, things like, gee, are there any additional apparent dose effects that we're not capturing things like that i didn't i don't think i did any other no i didn't do any other covariates but conceivably you could explore other covariates in the same way uh let's take a look at the table of parameters Okay, now as part of the, just the fitting diagnostics, not looking at the values, but first just let's take a look at the effective ends. And you can see we have some which are, you know, let's take a look at a few that jump out at me. Yeah, we got, you know, some in the, you know, oh, we got a couple of real stinkers down here. Yeah, we got a number of them that are, you know, under 100. Uh, in here. So that gives you a clue as to, you know, as to the need to do some additional samples to get adequate precision on those. I would, you know, uh, as a crude estimate, you know, let's say, you know, you might want to insist on getting, you know, maybe a, an effective end of around a thousand. So that would tell you you've got some here that are down in the neighborhood of only 50 or a bit less. So to get things around a thousand or so, you'd have to do what twenty times more samples uh, in order to do this, which is that's going to take a little while. Um, you know, that's now probably taking you in, into hours of uh, of a run here. But that's what would be desirable if you were going to use this for production purposes. Uh, let's see, I don't know that I wanted to say a whole lot about parameter values here, um, you know, other than, you know, things to, that you would be of interest uh, if you're looking at or, you know, you're going to be wanting to know things like the, the effect size for the given drugs, which are sort of captured by the, the E delta quantity here. Uh, you might also be interested in things like the slope. Uh, which gives you some idea of how fast the uh, disease progression is going, which is where? I think I need to go back and look at my, oh, that's right. We called it alpha, didn't we? Okay, where'd it go? There we go. So that tells you something. And I think that's in units of 8S cog units per week, as I recall. <laughs> Okay, I'm um, trying to think of other things I would want to tell you about it at this point. Nothing's immediately coming to mind uh, on this at the moment. Uh, 
the one thing I didn't do, which might be desirable, which would be of more interest, is now that we've got this, we might want to be able to say things about the, uh, say, the relative efficacy of the three compounds we've looked at here. Uh, so a logical next step would be to do, if you've decided that the model is appropriate, is to then take advantage of the model to do some posterior simulations uh, to look at things like population mean responses uh, or, you know, as a function of both time and dose uh, for the various compounds. I mean, one of the reasons, by the way, for doing this kind of a longitudinal analysis, and I didn't really didn't mention that, is you now if, if you actually, if everybody did their Alzheimer's studies for the same duration, uh, you know, you could, it would be perfectly reasonable to just analyze endpoint uh, for, for each of those trials and to compare the drug, uh, the results at endpoint for the different drugs. But what we find is there was a fair amount of heterogeneity in the, in the uh, duration of the various trials. So this is one way to take advantage of having a bunch of trials with uh, rather heterogeneous designs with respect to things like uh, the duration. Uh, so that, that's a logical reason for trying to combine, uh, you know, to bring all of that information and to model it longitudinally so that now you can make inferences uh, for various different points in time once you've done that. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let me take a breather here again for a second and see, uh, again, I guess it's still just you, Yuming, any, any questions? Okay, let's um, close that for now. Now, this was a sort of a complicated example because not only did we deal with the longitudinal aspects, but I probably overcomplicated the model with a number of elements like T distribution and so on. But what I want to do, have you guys, have you do, as well as other members of the class, is an example which actually builds on this one, but we're going to, we're going to simplify the model a bit uh, for doing it. Uh, also reduce the, uh, the body of data we're going to work with here. So for, for our hands-on problem that we'll go over on Monday, where is this? Okay. Uh, is, it's going to have you look at ADAS cog data again. Uh, so you're going to do a, a longitudinal dose response model based upon the summary data. And it's going to be ADAS cog. Uh, we're going to focus on just Nepazil uh, in this case. So we're basically just going to be looking at uh, denepazil versus placebo. Uh, so we're going to have our post baseline sample means and sample variances for ADAS cog change from baseline following various doses of denepazil from published sources. Uh, so basically, this is a subset of the data we were just looking at. Uh, and so, well, this just comments on where the data set came from, but this is just kind of a repeat of what you saw before, except that it's going to be a subset of that, just the denepazil and, um, and corresponding placebo data. Uh, the data sets in a file that you're a directory you have called ADAS COG hands-on, and inside there, there should be a file called denepazil ADAS data.csv. I actually haven't redone problem five in a while. Let me double check that everything's there where it belongs. ADAS COG hands-on, not to be confused with ADAS COG 2 hands-on. And let's see, yeah, Denepazil ADAS data. So that will be there to work with. Okay, and here's some looks at the data. So this is the data you're going to be working with. Uh, so again, this is all just denepazil and placebo outcomes for both means and standard deviations. And that's the data you're going to be working with. 
Uh, in this case, I'm going to simplify the model a little bit and not get quite so carried away. One, we're going to get rid of that somewhat complicated uh, placebo component in the model, which is probably just as well. And let's see, is this data? Um, you know, there may be some like go oh, study seven here that might support that that particular component. But a lot of the studies are too sparse during the early phase to even do a decent job of characterizing it. Uh, it, it caused a lot of grief. And we're going to use normal distributions. So we'll, we're not going to get carried away with the T. Uh, if you want to explore the additional complications of trying to incorporate those things, that's fine. But my recommendation is to first just take a shot at basically taking this sort of slimmed down version of the model. So we've still got our normally our normal residual variance component, uh, you know, and our model is now a slope times time plus a placebo component plus a drug component. Uh, the drug component is pretty much what we saw before. Uh, so we've got our this d over d ref raised to a a power here. Uh, d ref is something that's fixed ahead of time. Uh, and then E delta K, so it's influence, so it's possibly, well, let's see, yeah, do I have a, yeah, I've got a, yeah, I do have an intertrial random effect on that, and, you know, times time over ET50 time, plus time, oh, the D ref is right there, yep, yeah, five. Uh, our placebo component is now just going to be a, just instead of being a complicated function, it's just going to be a constant uh, component here. So basically what that is saying is that, let's say if you get a placebo effect, it's likely to just be an instant sort of bump downwards in time uh, that's related to uh, the placebo effect. And that that's all so as opposed to one that sort of comes on and goes away. Uh, and there's both intertrial and uh, Sorry, which way? Yeah, inter there's both inter individual and inter trial. Oh, I guess I forgot to mention I'm writing this first like I did before. I'm starting out by conceptualizing this in terms of a model for individual data that we then will adjust to describe our, our summary data. Uh, and then on our slope, we have again both uh, inter individual and inter trial random effects. And then we have our uh, our some intertrial random effects on the residual variance component. And then this is our description on how to deal with the for our sample means and variance. The sample mean is pretty straight ahead, uh, so it's just going to be our our basic model function uh, with the uh, sample size adjusted variance term. Uh, our sample variance has got the more complicated gamma component with the sigma squared marginal element in it. Uh, and then our inter our inter arm random effects now are the same as the inter individual, but with the variances adjusted by sample size. Uh, one recommendation I would make for building up for building up your model function is why don't you start by only modeling the sample means as a starting point. So base, so set up your model for that. When you do that, you won't need to incorporate uh, these components for the sample variance. You don't need to calculate the sigma squared marginal, for example, nor nor the likelihood here. So that I would recommend trying that as a first step. And then adding in, uh, adding in this component afterwards. That's chances are, if I was building up a model from scratch, that's probably how I would start anyway. Because for the most part, you get most of the information just using the sample means. Incorporating the sample variances is kind of a, you know, sort of a refinement, uh, but it's not generally critical for estimating the main parameters of your model. Okay. So that's the task for uh, for Monday, is to go ahead and build up this model. Um, I 
guess I will let you have a go at it. If I have time, I'll also maybe try and take a look at um, pulling together some population simulations from the model I had done before just to sort of illustrate how we might want to uh, uh, actually apply the model uh, into some context for doing some of the treatment comparisons. Uh, so any last questions before we disappear? <laughs> yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully I didn't leave it too confused, but uh, uh, at the same time, hopefully by uh, by having access to the slides, and if you want, you might want to take a look at one or two of the publications I pointed out to as a as another way to get a perspective on on dealing with these kinds of situations. Okay, well, I guess uh, I'll say goodbye for now, and I look forward to talking to you again on Monday.